Hi everyone, my name is Ankit and welcome to the second part of the series on how to conduct a fluid assessment. In this video, we'll be going through the components of the assessment, putting our findings into context and understanding uncertainty around clinical fluid assessment. Terminology is very important when either describing or documenting the fluid assessment. The terms hypo, hyper and uvolemia generally refer to total body volume. As we know from the previous video, this is made up of the intravascular and extravascular compartments. The clinical signs themselves may either look at the intravascular or extravascular volume. When we go through the fluid assessment later on in the video, have a think about whether the signs I mentioned look at intravascular or extravascular spaces. I'll be going through the fluid assessment in the context of two hypothetical scenarios. The first is Jim, a 74-year-old male who is a hospital inpatient. The nurses report to you that the oxygen saturations have decreased from 98% on room air to 90% on 3 litres of oxygen via nasal prongs. The second case is of Fiona, who is a 56-year-old female presenting to the emergency department with four days of unrelenting nausea and vomiting since receiving a cycle of chemotherapy. The clinical fluid assessment begins with understanding of the context of the patient, including any risk factors for hyper or hypovolemia, then taking a history, conducting a targeted examination, reviewing any relevant investigations or bedside charts, coming up with an assessment, and then instituting management. It is important to continue reassessing the situation as time goes on. I'll explain why in more depth later on in the video. Let's go through some risk factors for hypo or hypovolemia. For hypovolemia, we start with poor fluid intake. For patients with dementia or delirium or intellectual disability, they may not be able to respond to their thirst reflex, which means that they have poor fluid intake. With a perioperative patient, there may be a, an extended period of time where we, they may be near by our mouth prior to the operation. And even after the operation, when they're recovering from the anesthetic, they may not be drinking or eating as much as they normally would. There are also situations of fluid loss. Vomiting and diarrhea is a very uh, common one, and blood loss with hematemesis and melina. Some surgeries, especially intra-abdominal surgeries, can lead to a large amount of fluid loss, when, especially if there's evaporation from the bowels in the case of a laparotomy. Diuretics we use commonly on the wards, especially for patients with heart failure, can lead to hypovolemia when they're used um, in excess. Fever or sepsis is a special one where there is no true fluid loss. However, vasodilation throughout the body means that the patients may be intravascularly deplete, which can then compromise perfusion. Some other scenarios is include high stoma output and polyuria, which may be secondary to uncontrolled diabetes or hypercalcemia. When we look at hypervolemia, we have to first think about excessive fluid administration. IV fluids is a common source of excessive fluid administration, and we also should remember the occult fluids that are usually given with things like antibiotics. Blood transfusions is a way of giving fluid, and there are some situations where polydipsia might be a problem. There are also situations where fluid retention can cause hypovolemia. Heart failure, kidney failure, and liver failure are common examples. When you begin to see the patient, you can, may be able to elicit some symptoms of hypo or hypovolemia. In hypovolemia, the symptoms are generally quite nonspecific. Patients may report dizziness, which may be postural in nature. They may experience nausea, lethargy, or thirst. One study found that thirst did not correlate with the severity of dehydration in elderly patients. Hypervolemia, you may find patients who report shortness of breath. They may have orthopnea, PND, paroxysm and nocturnal dyspnea, or short of breath on exertion. Sometimes it can be difficult to assess shortness of breath on exertion, as many patients may not be very mobile while they're in hospital. Other symptoms include edema, fatigue, and weight gain, which are relatively non-specific again. The way I structure my fluid assessment examination is the way I structure every other examination that we've been taught through medical school. I start with the general appearance, look at the vital signs, check the hands for the capillary refill, look at the mucous membranes, go down to the neck and look for the JVP, listen for the lung sounds, the heart sounds, and then examine the extravascular spaces, which include the abdomen, the sacrum, especially if the patient is bedbound, and the lower limbs for any lower limb edema. In hypovolemia, you might find on general appearance that the patient is lethargic or drowsy. You might find evidence of hypotension or postural hypotension. They may also be tachycardic. 
In cases of quite severe hypovolemia, the capillary refill might be delayed. The mucous membranes can be dry, um, especially with tongue dryness and furrows. You might notice that their JVP is not visible and therefore they have a low JVP. Lung sounds, heart sounds and extravascular spaces are generally unremarkable. In hypervolemia, patients may appear anxious or in respiratory distress. They may have decreased oxygen saturation, a high respiratory rate, and may even be hypertensive in the early stages of APO. The hypertension is due to an adrenergic response to acute pulmonary edema. There are some cases where the patients may be in APO and hypotensive, and this has a worse outcome. In terms of capillary refill and mucous membranes are generally unremarkable. The JVP might be high, and the lung sounds, you might hear crepitations and plural, uh, hear evidence of a pleural effusion. If you're lucky, you might be able to hear some extra heart sounds, although I find these quite difficult to hear. In terms of extravascular spaces, you might find edema, especially in the sacral area. You might find evidence of ascites in quite decompensated uh, liver failure, um, and quite rarely in heart failure. You may also find lower limb edema. In the ward setting, the bedside folder may contain a fluid balance chart. Since the kidneys are one of the most sensitive organs to changes in perfusion, the urine output can also be used as a measure of intravascular volume. For further study, I will leave a link to Dr. Hislop's podcast on oliguria in the description. A weight chart may also be useful to track flu levels over a period of few days. Investigations that might be useful include a chest x-ray, which can reveal evidence of hypervolemia. Keep in mind that these particular signs are quite specific, but not very sensitive, so a normal chest x-ray does not exclude hypervolemia. The renal function and electrolytes may also give an idea of the current fluid state. For example, hypernatremia is most commonly caused by a water deficit. In summary, the fluid assessment begins by understanding the context of the fluid review, looking at the patient history for any identifiable risk factors for volume disturbance. Then seeing the patient, getting consent, and getting conducting a targeted examination. Review the charts if available and look at any relevant investigations. It is then time to make an assessment based on all the information that you've gleaned, then institute management. The final step is to have a plan for reassessment, which I'll explain in the next slide. Most of the clinical symptoms and signs that I've mentioned have low sensitivity, but have reasonable specificity. What this means is that the absence of one particular sign does not have any significant implication on its own. As a result of the low sensitivity of the clinical fluid assessment, we are generally only able to pick up the extremes of volume status. Many of the patients in the middle of this continuum are not able to be picked up. This is why a fluid assessment needs to take into account all the information that is available and be put into context. The most important part of managing this uncertainty is to have a plan for reassessment. Reassessment allows for a checking me mechanism. It allows for any changes in the clinical situation to be recognized and addressed. The frequency of reassessment will depend on how sick the patient is and how severe you think the volume problem is. Let's go through a couple of examples to put it all together. Jim is a hospital inpatient and you've been alerted by the nursing staff that the patient has suddenly become hypoxic and is now requiring 3 litres of oxygen to maintain saturations at 90%. A review of Jim's medical history shows a past history of CCF, ischemic heart disease, COPD, and carotid kidney injury. He presented with undifferentiated abdominal, abdominal pain and has had a CT abdo pelvis this afternoon. On this morning ward round, he was noted to have normal OBS, but now reports feeling breathless and is unable to lie flat due to breathlessness. When you examine Jim, you note on general appearance that he's sitting upright with the oxygen going through nasal prongs. His vital signs reveal that he's saturating 90% on, on oxygen with 3 litres, a respiratory rate of 22, a heart rate of 90, and he's hypertensive at 180 systolic. The capillary refill is normal and the mucous membranes are moist. The JVP is elevated all the way up to the earlobe. The lung fields reveal evidence of crackles by basally, and his heart sounds reveal a pansystolic murmur. There is no ascites or sacral edema, but there is mild peripheral edema up to the ankles. The charts reveal he was given two litres of fluid since he presented to the emergency department in the morning. One of these litres was given over four hours for prehydration prior to the CT scan. You also note that Jim was normally on a fluid restriction of 1.5 litres. There is no chest x-ray, but his creatinine is 150. 
you do not have a baseline creatinine to compare. What would be your assessment? Perhaps your assessment is that he's hypervolemic due to IV fluid administration on the background of multiple risk factors including CCF, chronic kidney injury, and also perhaps valvular disease given the pansystolic murmur. You request an ECG to rule out ischemic heart disease or ischemic event, give IV fruzamide for symptom relief, and organize a portable chest x-ray. You aim to continue the fluid balance chart that has already been um, started. In the meantime, you speak to your registrar for further advice and aim to reassess the situation in one hour. The second example is of Fiona, who is presented to the emergency department with intractable nausea and vomiting since receiving the chemotherapy four days ago. Review of the medical history reveals that she has a resectable GOJ cancer, for which she received a cycle of neoadjuvant chemotherapy four days ago. When you see Fiona, she reports feeling thirsty and tired. She hasn't been able to keep anything down despite taking her antiemetics. She also reports that she isn't passing much urine. On examination, she appears lethargic lying in bed. Her vital signs reveal that she is tachycardic with a postural drop of 25 millimeters of mercury. She has normal capillary refill, dry mucous membranes, and you aren't able to see her JVP. Her lungs are clear, she has normal heart sounds, and there's no edema noted in the extravascular spaces. Since she has just arrived to the emergency department, she has no charts available for you to review. The blood tests from the day before chemotherapy compared to today reveals that her creatinine has doubled and she is hypokalemic. What would be your assessment in this situation? Perhaps your assessment is that she is hypovolemic. She's had poor oral intake due to persistent nausea and vomiting after receiving chemotherapy. She has evidence of acute kidney injury and also has hypokalemia. You suspect that she may also have an element of metabolic alkalosis since she has been vomiting up so much of a gastric acid. You decide to commence fluid rehydration and also replace her potassium. You give antiemetics intravenously and speak to the ED consultant about admitting Fiona into the hospital. Other potential situations where you may be asked to conduct a fluid review may be around the perioperative period, post blood transfusions, dyspneic patients, patients who have pancreatitis, patients with diarrhea, or perhaps you're called by the nursing staff who may be asking you whether the fluids that are currently being charted should continue or whether you should also chart more fluids for the future. Thank you for listening to this video. Please share it if you found it useful. And I look forward to hearing your comments and feedback in the comment section below. Thank you.